everyone. Welcome back to Author Chat. Today I have with me post-apocalyptic adventure romance writer A.M. Giver. Hi. Hi, how are you today? Great. Thanks so much for joining me today. Oh no, thank you. I really appreciate getting to do this today. Now you have out uh, two books in your Undead Age series, Love in an Undead Age, Damage in an Undead Age, and now you have a third book coming out, May 25th, Reckoning in an Undead Age, and also the prequel novella is available, and uh, is want to tell us a bit about your novels, your series? Sure, sure, absolutely. Um, so um, I write post-apocalyptic fiction, and um, basically, I really like zombies. And um, and when I was trying to figure out what to write, zombies came up, and it was like, oh, that's that's the thing. So uh, in in my book, it's a little different than a lot of zombie novels or my series because I it's set ten years after all all of this has happened after the fall of civilization as we know it. So, um, you know, so I, I was able to, to look at what would it look like now and versus, you know, back um, when people are just trying to like get through and survive day to day. So in my series, the main character is this post-apocalyptic urban farmer and, um, and she lives in uh, California in, in an area where there's basically a cold war going on. There's a faction that has a vaccine and, uh, but they don't share it because they use it to keep people under their thumb. And there's another faction which she's aligned with who are trying to steal it. So basically from that, so the overall perspective is that it's, it's kind of like a heist. She gets drawn into this, this plot to steal the vaccine um, at the same time a former uh, flame comes back into town. He is also part of this part of this um, scenario, and um, you know, and she, she's got a lot of baggage, having you know lived through the end of the world. And um, so he shows up, and she's not like really quite sure what to make of this. Um, and uh, so that's that's the ba the basic setup is it's this heist with this former lover and. Um, you know, the, uh, how things play out from there. And the vaccine they're after, what is that for? What is it? It's for, well, in, in these books, there's a, the zombie, uh, turning into a zombie is caused by a virus. So there's a, there's a vaccine you can take um, before anything happens to you and kind of like the flu. And then if you get bit by a zombie, you can't turn into one. Just like if the flu germ comes along or virus comes along, it can't get you sick where uh, and then there's a, a second one which is which is works after you've been bitten if you get it within a particular time frame but you have to take it every day and that one is what really helps the bad guys solidify their power base because they've got all these people who are dependent on them um, which makes it very easy for them to control the population okay and so they're um they have that they've already defeated the zombies or they still have no there's a... still very there's still very many zombies around in the world because the survival rate of humanity in my book it's probably around five percent you know so there's billions of zombies in the world and there's okay. just little pockets of civilization that you know have managed to hang on these these small enclaves so Okay, so they're like, you know, like fortified against zombie and have zombie attacks and stuff. And yeah, exactly. You know, and, you know, always trying to be vigilant to make sure that like no one who's affected would get inside a secure area because then that would, you know, <laughs> undermine the whole point of having a safe area. <laughs> I know it's kind of I mean as I talked to you about this it, it all sounds kind of ridiculous <laughs> but but it is fun to, but it is fun when you're in the adventure it's fun when, when I talk about like everything that goes into it it's like this is kind of ridiculous but, <laughs> but, it, but, it, but it's, it's good stuff <laughs> well 
I mean, it's they're fighting for their lives. So that's the, uh, you know, that's an, the ultimate goal there. And uh, for civilization, that, I mean, it sounds entertaining and something you can get swept away in. Well, mm -hmm. and that's what I like about post-apocalyptic fiction. I don't really particularly, it's not the event itself as much as how do people survive it and what happens after, you know, because there are so many possibilities for how things can shake out. And it's going to be different in every place because you'll have some, some of the circumstances of your um, survival are going to be unique. So, uh, so, you know, so like I've read post-apocalyptic fiction that includes supernatural events that, you know, make electricity not work. I've, you know, there's EMP post-apocalyptic fiction, there's nuclear war. I mean, like you name it, somebody has thought of, of it, but, um, but they're always about how do people survive. And, um, and that's the, that's, that's what I find interesting about post-apocalyptic fiction. And so far on your series, do all, all three books follow are the same main characters? Is it? Yeah. Okay. And yes. the there's, character there's, arc goes through. That, yeah. So, you know, uh, trying to, you know, have the character characters begin in one place, but end up in another, which is, you know, hopefully a, a, a good transformative story, though, you know, sometimes people don't transform in good ways. So, you know, you have to decide which way you want to take it. I, I tend to be more of a life affirming transformation <laughs> kind of writer. <laughs> and is the third one the is that wrapping up the series your series there? That is wrapping up this trilogy um, of this particular set of characters. I have a second trilogy set in the same undead age world, but this one's going to be in a different place with a different set of characters at a different point in time. It's going to be happen earlier um, mm -hmm. in time. So, uh, so, you know, so, so I've got that plan. I actually have to sit down and really outline it instead of the in my head outline, which I'm sure you're familiar with. <laughs> <laughs> Very much so. <laughs> it's great, but you can't count on remembering it. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> And so, oh, what drew you to the genre of a post zombies and a post apocalyptic worlds? And, um, you know, probably uh, growing up with uh, so many older brothers and sisters is really what did it be. Not because, like, we had a Lord of the Flies, you know, childhood or anything <laughs> like that, but because um, I'm the second youngest of nine kids, and uh, my oldest brother is. Um, is 12 years older than me. So when I was a kid, I got exposed to like a lot of things earlier than some of my friends, you know, um, in terms of, certainly in terms of music, you know? Um, and uh, like, I heard about punk rock when I was eight years old because my brother bought it, brought it back from college and we all thought it was terrible, you know? But like, so like stuff my friends were, were, were you know, discovering 10 years later, you know? I, I would, you know, in terms of popular culture. So, um, so but one of the things that um, was always really uh, popular in my family were ghost stories and scary movies. So um, my brothers used to stay up on the weekends and watch these scary, this, it was like a, a TV show called Chiller Theater. It was one of those like on local, late at night you know they would show you like dracula and you know <laughs> curse of the mummy and you know all these like 50s science fiction uh, invader movies and and whatnot and um and i wasn't allowed because i was too young to watch <laughs> these so what happened is when i got to a certain point i would sneak down and watch it with them you know so my, you know, my mother thought I'd got to bed and I would sneak down and and I mean it was great it was terrifying and you know <laughs> I'd have nightmares but I would keep doing it um so you know just a great love of being scared um you know of these uh safe thrills you know, as it were and um and then in terms of zombies you know Pittsburgh is a uh, is where George Romero filmed a lot of his films. And, you know, he's the godfather of the 
modern zombie genre. I mean, like he really completely reinvented it because up to that point, zombies had been associated with the whole voodoo uh, Caribbean um, tradition. So, you know, that they were not what they are now. So, you know, there was this outside George Romero influence in the area, you know, and my, my brothers were like totally into his movies, which again, I was not allowed to go to the theater to see. Um, <laughs> I didn't see them till many years. Like my mother was absolutely right about that, by the way. Um, <laughs> I was too young, but um, so so that's that's pretty much what drew me into it. You know, early conditioning and you know my brain getting wired in that way to, <laughs> to really like these these scary tales of survival. <laughs> And you said you add in some romantic elements to your story. So how do you balance in the romance with, you know, the uh, post-apocalyptic world there? Uh, Well, you know, the reason I do that is, well, first off, I love a good love story, you know, and, um, and I think a lot of, excuse me, a lot of the, the stories I like, whether they're you know, considered a romance or not, they, they often have a love story in them. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, I don't lose interest if I'm reading a book that doesn't have some kind of love story in it, but they're definitely more compelling to me when the characters, um, when there is some kind of, of love interest, you know, whether it's, you know, one that turns out well or, or is unrequited, it still makes it interesting. And I think, you know, when the world has ended and you're just scrabbling to survive, you really need something to live for. It's got to be more than just everyday survival. So, you know, and love is the most compelling emotion and um, motivator that there is. So, you know, that is like writ large. That's that's why. Um, as far as as far as putting it into the story, it's actually it's very easy, you know, because you're you're just writing about people, you know, you're just writing about people, and they have the same motivations and the same desires and wants and needs that um, you would have whether you were in that situation or you're you know living your life in the suburbs or you know you're a young professional out in the city, you know, for the first time, you know, people still have the same emotional motivations and desires and needs. Um, so, you know, so yeah, they might be killing zombies while they're falling in love with someone. So, you know, and that's gonna be very different than, you know, learning to ski while you're falling in love with someone. <laughs> um, one thing I should say is that my books are, they do have a love story in them, but they're not romance driven. You know, the romance does not drive the story. That's why I always, like to emphasize the adventure part because if if readers are looking for and I've actually gotten reviews which is fair you know it's like where's the romance you know and it's like well it's a love story it's not necessarily a romance and that's a that's an important distinction um you know so they're not romance driven but there is a lot of but there is romance in them you know but but they're definitely a more because of the demands of the genre, they really are more um, plot driven in terms of adventure and survival. Right, right. Yeah, you have to be careful. You can't call it a romance if it doesn't meet those no. specific things there because people will get upset. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, and yeah. You know, had I been thinking about that when I chose a title, I might have chosen something different, but um, <laughs> but I wasn't. So we are where we are. That is true. All right. This is a, uh, a choice question here. Do you feel like it's most important to have A, strong characters, B, mind-blowing plot twists, or C, an epic setting? characters I think it's important to have strong characters because um you can have a really great plot twist and you can have epic settings but if you don't have characters people care about it won't matter what all the other stuff is that you know it's just like a movie you can have a movie that's like 
got cinematography as good as Lawrence of Arabia, but if the characters aren't interesting, you're not going to finish. That's true. I agree. I like that. Do you have any tips for writers on creating a post-apocalyptic setting? Um, I chose to write the story in a place where I was living at the time. You know, um, I, uh, I was living in San Jose, California, and writing in a setting that you're familiar with, I, I found that helpful starting out. Now, my other books are set in places where I what, had never been or had not been there when I was writing them. So that's not, that's not, um, that's, it's not a, you don't have to do that. You know, there's nothing hard and fast, but I would say more fundamentally to get a good handle on craft, you know, to really work hard on being able to write well. Um, and to, you know, to find other writers and other aspiring writers to work with and critique. Um, because like, that's how I learned how to write, you know, like I, I had potential when I was st started my book and, and I, um, I had always been a good writer, but I didn't understand the structure of story in terms of like how, um, how everything that happens in your stories needs to move it forward. If it doesn't, it shouldn't be in your story. Like I, I didn't understand that. And I didn't understand certain rules of writing. I really did not understand point of view um, and how to, you know, be consistent with point of view and to do it correctly. So I, I would just say more fundamentally find other writers to work with, find people who are better at it than you to critique your work. Um, and always, you know, find books that, you know, you think may be helpful. And every book, whether every book I've ever read, there's one thing in it. You know, there might not be a ton that's new. But there's always one thing in there that I've never heard before. Mm -hmm. um, so to really, really work on the craft, because if you've got, if you've got craft and if you're working hard to improve your craft, you can write pretty much anything, I think. As long as it interests you. That's the other thing too, I would say, is don't write something that doesn't interest you. Um, I really enjoy sci-fi romances. I think they're great fun, but I'm not interested in writing them. And I have, um, I outlined one and I even kind of started a little bit. And I was just like, this sucks because, <laughs> because I, I, it wasn't what I wanted to write, you know? And I, I'm sure there are people who can decide I'm going to write this genre and maybe it's something they, they read. Maybe it isn't, maybe it's something that interests them or maybe it doesn't who can write great books, but like, I'm not one of those people. So, you know, I would find if, if you're the kind of person who finds that you, you can't write in a genre unless you're interested in it, then don't do that, you know, stick to what you're interested in. But if, but if you're someone who's more versatile than I am and can write in anything, you know, go for it. Yeah, and I think most of the time if you're miserable while writing it and you don't want to go to the keyboard and write your words for the day, then the, I think the reader can sense that, that it comes across. Oh, I so, agree. I absolutely yeah. agree. Yeah, I think so too. So, How many drafts do your books go through before publication? Um, my first book, I think I had six or seven drafts. Um, which is so painful. Um, the second book, I only wrote two drafts. I, I wrote the first draft and I wrote the, I, I did the rewrite and then I, um, and then I sent it off to people to, to look at. Um, and I think a lot of that was because I had a firmer grasp of the story and what I wanted it to be. Um, and I think this last book is probably gonna end up being three drafts. Again, I have a firmer grasp of the story and what it needs to be, though um, wrapping it up has been challenging. And that's, you know, it's because you really wanna, I really wanna give the people who have spent the time reading these 125,000 word books, um, an ending that is satisfying and that, you know, they feel like, oh, this was time well spent. And endings are hard. <laughs> I mean, they, they are challenging. And 
I um I really have a lot more um empathy for screenwriters who you know you watch these movies and they're great and then they blow the end like I get it now it's really easy to 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 blow the end and, and it's it, it's very challenging to really wrap things up in a way that 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 is um that is going to deliver what the story and what your reader should get. So yeah. you want it to be a satisfying ending for people who've gone through all of the series and stuck with it. I, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah it, it's, I, I, I heard a, um, I heard an interview recently with Elena Johnson and she writes um, Western cowboy romance. And she was saying that you have to deliver on the promise. So, so if you're writing happily ever after romance, you have to have happily ever after because that's what you've promised. You know, if if you've written, um, a, if you say you're writing a space opera that's going to have a tragic ending, you got to have that. You got to pro- give people what you've promised. So I I like that um, that framing of it. Uh, that you know, writing something for people is a promise that you have to deliver. I agree. Do you use uh, beta readers or critique partners? Um, I use at the, I use I kind of use both, but I do it at the end. Um, I don't get critiqued as I write anymore. Um, I had a really great writing group when I first started writing and um, but I wasn't trying to stick to a schedule. So I used to get a lot more input while, the writing process was going on. Um, but since I started really devoting my time to writing and wanting to get these books out, like I just am writing too fast, too much um, to, to be participating in the group fairly. Like I'd be asking them to do so much more for me versus what I could do for them mm-hmm. and you know, what we're every, and what the agreement in the, in the group is. So I do use beta readers. I kind of have my like first and second round of beta readers because my first round of beta readers tend to be other writers and, um, and uh, within the genre. And I, you know, ask them to take a look. And then once I've got that cleaned up and, you know, have considered their suggestions and, you know, taken them or not, then I um, will send it out to beta readers who are, readers versus writers so the boy they have some really good suggestions sometimes and they really point things out they were like this was confusing it's like, <laughs> yeah i need to fix that <laughs> so, so how do you get the uh, creativity flowing maybe if you when you sit down and maybe you're not quite feeling it um sometimes it's just a slog and you have to accept that it's just a slog um so but I, I find that the more I'm the more I write the more ideas I have the more it flows you know and I think that's because you know the brain is always working on it even when you aren't actively thinking about it um but you know just forcing yourself to sit down and write it eventually even if it's not like the whole the whole time you're writing, even if it's just like you one 15 minute interval in there where like, it really feels like you're firing on all cylinders, you know, you'll at least get that. Though I find, you know, the more you do it, the more you have that. Um, but it, it really is, um, it really requires a lot of discipline. You can't sit around waiting for the muse because the muse is very flaky. Right. Um, but if you sit down and you write every day, she really shows up. <laughs> <laughs> she knows you're expecting her. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So uh, what's next for you after you release this next, uh, the book in May? What's uh, what's next? Um, well, I've also got audio books for this particular series coming out at the same time. So I'm really excited about that. And I um, really hope people like them. Um, so we'll see. Um, and uh, then, you know, I'll be writing this. I've, I've actually got two trilogy ideas and, I, and I'm going to try working on them in tandem. Um, I've got a, this second zombie apocalypse series. But then I'm also going to um, write a YA dystopian um, 
also post-apocalyptic dystopian story, but um, it's going to be, you know, it won't be zombies or anything. It's, it's about a, a young man who's going to be kind of caught up in this, this um, well, basically a plague, you know, and, and trying to figure out how to, how to survive in that. And, um, and so, so I'm going to try to write both of those at the same time. We'll see, you know, like try one week working on the one and one week working on the other and that I may stick with it or I may, you know, just, you know, set it, set one aside and, and work on the, the work on one or the other, but, but that's the plan. We'll see. Plans don't always pan out the way I think they're going to. Where can readers find out more about you and your books? Well, I have a website, um, www.amgeber, that's G-E-E-B-E-R, um, dot com. I'm also on Facebook, A.M. Giver Author, and I have a reader group, um, A.M. Giver's Zombie Apocalypse Bunker. Um, though that, I'm, I'm kind of hit or miss about that, unfortunately. Um, I'm also, um, I'm much better on my author page. Um, and then I'm on Instagram as well, um, AM Giver uh, there as well. I, I have Twitter, but I'm very, I don't really do much on Twitter and I try to avoid it because it's like a time sink rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> I will have all of AM's links down in the description. So check that out and uh, grab her apocalypse novels and uh thank you so much am for joining me today thank you i really appreciate it and uh thank you everyone for watching and uh, we'll see you next week